welcome to the Long-Term Care Chronicles podcast. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Jane Teasdale from the Mosaic Home Care and Community Resource in regards to COVID-19. Thank you, Jane, for coming out and speaking uh, with us today here at the uh, the Long-Term Care Chronicles uh, podcast. So we'll go into the questions that uh, we'll have. So starting, um, so with the virus, for your organization, when did you realize that this was um, a very serious, um, I guess, concern at the, when it became, I guess, more impactful? Okay. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Wendy, for having uh, me come and speak on the podcast today for Family Council's Collaborative Alliance. Um, and to answer your question, I think, you know, it, it all started really back in January 2020, um, approximately January 23rd, for a series of events and dates with regards to COVID-19 pandemic. On January 23rd, we heard that Wuhan, China, were preventing people from leaving their homes, traveling, shopping, and they were discussing the seriousness of the COVID-19. My business partner and I were concerned with traveling to the UK Uh, we had actually a conference to attend as keynotes for the person-centered care conference in the UK. At that time when we were in the UK, uh, there were professionals, clinicians, academics from all over the world were discussing this pandemic and hospitals in the UK were actually preparing protocols and so forth. When we came back to Canada on March 2nd, and we were concerned on how, how Canada was not treating this pandemic seriously. We thought that public health in Canada was playing down the risks of COVID. We looked at some of the studies and the reports regarding this type of pandemic from other parts of the world. We were seeing what was happening in long-term care homes in Spain. When we came back to Toronto, Mosaic implemented our own COVID-19 pandemic protocols. Uh, We did this before WHO, World Health Organization, declared this as a pandemic. Staff were wearing masks uh, while working with clients. We didn't just address symptoms, we addressed the contact risks. Instructed caregivers to avoid all social interactions and to start following social distancing, physical distancing themselves. Mosaic re-emphasized hand washing and other protocols and emphasized its importance. Our client services staff contacted caregivers and families sent out communication on what Mosaic is implementing as protocols to keep our PSWs and clients safe. Uh, We also developed sign-in sheets, protocols for contact tracing for visitors in their homes or for other care providers coming into our clients' homes in the community to document and sign. So a lot of the families were actually having private caregivers coming in. Mm -hmm. And also we had Lynn's coming in and other health professionals coming in. So how... How as an organization are you monitoring the contacts of contacts? That's really important. Um, um, We were transparent with our families and PSWs, keeping them abreast of the situation and updates as they change daily. Public Health on 12th of March said they effectively contained the virus spread in the community. They were not vigilant and made it seem that only travel was the cause. On March 16th, There was limited essential visitors, excluded families going into long-term care on the March 18th, extended it to retirement homes. Following that, on March 24th, long-term care homes allowed for more flexible staff, hiring of temporary staff, part-time workers and volunteers, and opened the door to high levels of community transmission. Families were still excluded from going into homes to provide the the personal care that their family member needed. The ministry only really seemed to get serious on the 15th of April, when they restricted staff from working at multiple facilities, more aggressive testing and redeploying people from hospitals to work, and looking at infection prevention control. On the 27th of May, the government and the Ministry of Health responded to the Army report. They they started deploying inspection teams into the long-term care homes. The Army found that there were many issues, but issues that had been found out prior to COVID uh, but had not been amplified. So some of them were due to poor infection control methods. 
uh, dehydration, malnutrition, sanitary conditions, people crying out for help and not getting it, soiled bed sheets, items being reused, force feeding, residents lying down while eating and people dying. Thank you. Yeah, can I just can I just add a point? Yeah, I, go ahead. I, I think one of the one of the things that we um, were aware of is that there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty as to what was really happening with the virus, um, and so we did a lot of our own research. And what we felt was that just checking for symptoms was not going to be enough. That we had to look at contact risks and to take responsibility for that. So we emphasized contact risk um, and, and also educating care workers and families That's so that right. we, could, mm -hmm. we could work together on that. So we, we, we did not feel there was an, enough work being done on that front. And probably still in the community now, we, we re, um, uh, um, I help the home care, um, my wife's home care company, um, there really isn't enough public health um, interaction with home care and home and community care. So I think it's almost as if we're the institutions, we're doing it on our own, we'll do whatever we think is necessary. And ignoring the fact that the wider community also has responsibility. And yes. that, yeah. that tends to reflect on the family caregiver issue. So uh, the institutional decision-making process by really downplaying these risks and not bringing in the wider community is the same approach really to its attitude towards family caregivers anyway. I, I, yes. I think it's just something. Yeah, that's right. So in regards to, I guess, the with the government and of course these institutions not acting quick enough to be able to contain the virus, um, really indicated for to be able to grow and spread within these facilities. I, I, well, at the time, we, the government seemed to think that it was still really, the risk was coming from abroad. And um, the WHO actually um, um, changed their risk assessment in Canada to local transmission very early in March. And I don't really think that was picked up by public health. So I, I do feel perhaps that public health did not feel it was going to progress to the level it was. And if you are, have any experience in risk management, you know that you have to address uncertainty and you have to address those risks that maybe have a small probability but have massive impact. I think that's where public health fails and perhaps where they let down our long-term cares because uh, as you see, most of the deaths have occurred in long-term care, most of the vulnerable people are in long-term care. So you only needed a small probability for a big impact and that risk really was not properly managed. So I guess it goes to the whole question in terms of with the uh, these facilities not really being equipped in terms of the seriousness of the outbreak, right? That's right. So on, yeah. on March the 12th, actually, there was communication from the ministry that they had contained it, and it was not community spread. Um, you know, on March 16th, again, uh, limiting it to essential visitors, government stopped non-essential visitors which were some families and private caregivers. Actually, Mosaic considers families as essential visitors, and they provided some of the care for their family member, friend, or partner. Uh, we were considered uh, with this and knew that things were going to go downhill rapidly within the long-term care homes, um, and also with the issue with the P lack of PSWs available. Um, really, the government should have had a plan in the community to move some of the residents who were able, yeah. able to leave with supports in the community. Um, many of these homes may not have had time to inform. I think this is a problem is because yeah. COVID came very quickly and they weren't, nobody was really prepared for this. Um, so we just don't know about, you know, what actually happened in the long term care. Um, and the ministry doesn't seem to provide much detail on their reasoning behind this. Uh, families really don't have direct contact with the ministry. Um, we also feel uh, felt that families were not told or explained properly, should have been given advance notice. Many of our caregivers were going to shifts and being turned away from the long-term care homes. Families were stopped going into the homes for visits, 
and actually they were providing some of the care for their family member or partner. The families were feeling upset, confused, worried that their family member or partner would not be getting the care that they needed. Um, also, a lot of the families are really concerned about the isolation and loneliness um, of their family members kept in their rooms, which perhaps at some point uh, brought back difficult times um, in the resident's life. Perhaps they were, you know, in the war. Um, calls were not being returned to families in a timely manner through the long-term care homes. To explain the situation, they didn't have the staff to answer the many calls coming through and answering the questions, I, I would presume. Um, so we had a lot of, um, you know, I had to make a lot of uh, calls to the long-term care, you know, to actually find out what was happening and, and, and speaking to the family members who were worried. Um, families were essential visitors and provided much of the care. They were providing much of the feeding, companionship, advocacy, oversight, and providing the care that the resident wasn't receiving in the home. Many families had hired private caregivers pre-COVID. So really, this has been going on for a long time. <laughs> COVID just, just brought it out more. Um, you know, a lot of the families knew that the, the care homes couldn't deliver the person-centered care approach. Um, they couldn't provide the one-on-one -on -one care. And the care was mostly focused on task focused. Um, uh, so no matter who the family spoke to actually in these long-term care homes, the ministry set the guidelines which the long-term care facilities had to adopt and follow um, and no real communication that could be made. Um, we felt that families were really left out of the loop feeling helpless and ignored in this situation. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a sentiment that a lot of uh, family members have as well with residents of not being communicated to as to what was going on in their particular facilities as well. So um, with that as well, in terms of the testing that was done for um, the residents uh, in these long-term care facilities, especially at the early stage of the outbreak, um, do you feel, like in your opinion, do you feel that um, testing was was sufficient in order to be able to contain? Um... Um, so I think through, you know, our institutions, I don't think they were equipped to deal with such a serious outbreak. I don't think yeah. anybody was. <laughs> um, you know, you have researchers from all over the world. No, nobody knew how this COVID-19 was going to play out. Um, you know, I don't think that there also was enough PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, that we needed for the outbreak. Um, there were back orders uh, that were taking time to reach the community. Uh, Long-term care homes, hospitals, retirement, and home care providers, again, all scrambling for PPE equipment. Um, Long-term care homes didn't seem to have the protocols in place for this type of pandemic. Um, and they were treating this like a flu-like uh, symptom or respiratory illness. Uh, so, I. I you know, I think that when dealing with a new virus, we need to treat it with high, a high level of caution. Um, again, they didn't have the pandemic protocols in place for such outbreak as COVID-19. Um, you know, so they had to look at that. Exposed on the staffing front, there were staffing were precarious and such in long-term care homes. They were working at a number of locations. So PSWs were working at one location, working in long-term care. So this was putting the long-term care homes under risk. Um, these uh, homes were also understaffed and couldn't deal with the surge in care. Many of the long-term care homes were calling upon home care agencies to provide the care. This created actually a whole other problem yeah. for agencies in keeping their caregivers safe and their staffing levels. Because once... Um, the PSW got into the home, there was an outbreak, that person had to go into isolation or quarantine for 14 days. So a lot of home care agencies were called, but again, we also had care in the community that we had to look after. Um, so it was, it was a bit difficult for us to really help. Um, obviously, there was a lack of supply of PSWs. Uh, PSWs getting sick and being put into isolation. Um, caregivers not wanting to work right, um, or had underlying medical issues themselves which could put them at risk in a long-term care home. 
And then this also leaves stress levels in working through COVID-19 in a long-term care facility. Absolutely. So now, I guess, looking going forward, um, how do you think in terms of, I guess, that we can or that governments should be able to implement uh, protocols to be able to assist um, and to allow um, family members and, of course, to deal with the physical and the emotional needs of these residents in long-term care um, because we're having people that are either, you know, they have either dementia, Parkinson's, or as well, um, they may be palliative. So how do we deal with that? So I think, um, you know, we are going to have to address the social and emotional more and needs, and we are going to have to spend more time addressing the higher communication needs of those with advanced dementia um, and individuals with advanced Parkinson's. Um, we are going to have to provide more holistic palliative care. Um, people shouldn't be left to die in their beds without any person-centeredness provided. Those last moments of life are important, not just clinically, but socially, emotionally and spiritually. So we need more palliative care focus, especially for those approaching end of life. And we need more time to deliver this type of care. Palliative care is a holistic process. And I think also connecting people to the community, um, you know, to families, we're needing to use the community assets that are bringing. Absolutely. Um, Can I just? Yes. I think what one of the things that that um, we've learned while developing person-centered care is that there's gen that there, are, there appears to be a, an undervaluation of, of of the person and of care itself, um, and it's it's almost as if. Um, the care process is viewed as, so, as, so, as something similar to producing t-shirts where you want your workers to produce as many shirts as possible and if you produce as shirt, many shirts as possible you need to employ less people to do the work. And one of the things that, that we realize is that care is actually a very complex area um, and that you can't rush things through and it's not just about personal support but it's about human interaction. And there's also a large element of clinical knowledge and oversight. So the actual care process itself is much more complex. And those two factors that care is not valued and the person isn't valued um, uh, are two really important issues. So we have to um, realize that care is important. We have to value the person. We need more resources. And we're also going to have to change the structure of long-term care homes because uh, they're too. They're too big. If you yes. have an institute, if you have an area where there are loads of people with complex care needs that need to be taken care of, but, um, what the institution looks at is all the liabilities. And so, what tends to happen is that the, the more, the higher the complexity, the fewer the resources, the greater the number of people, the more the rights of the individual are taken out of the picture. So we really need to look at long-term care. We need to probably totally change its structure and focus, increase resources, and within that, bring in higher levels of home and community care. And as James said, bringing in a, a much higher yeah. level of resources towards palliative care, that holistic Absolutely. care towards people who may be towards the end of life. So it, it is complex. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Dr. Sinha, you know, stated in many of his conversations on webinars, um, looking at the Denmark uh, model, right, where um, sort of in, in the community, um, providing more care in the community, keeping those complex cases in the long-term care, which will free up the space. Yes. Um, but again, you know, sometimes it's difficult for families, either they're working um, they can't provide the care, so they're needing actually to, to look at community organizations. Uh, private home care organizations yeah. are filling that need because they also have, um, you know, worked on different models such as what we've done on the person-centered care side. So, yes, yeah, so all those things are important. Can you be looked at? Absolutely. Uh, and I think um, what, the, what the current situation where family caregivers are locked out has really emphasized is the, the importance of co-production, that all these entities 
um, that are surround care are actually very important parts. And families uh, are not just people who go and say hello, they actually provide important yes, aspects yes. of care. So if, this, if family caregivers are part of the system, they, the decision rules within the system have to take them into consideration. So the system has to be built as it really is. Yeah. So those are some of the very important issues. So as changes we go forward, we're going to have to embed not just person-centered, high care values, more resources, we're going to actually have to embed the reality of co-production. Yeah. So, you know, and that to me is, you know, an essential issue, I think. There yeah. are, yeah, there are some long-term cares that are changing in terms of yeah. more humanistic-based yeah. approach, and I think probably more of that will definitely need to be incorporated moving forward uh, to get that done. So, um, in regards to, with, I guess, with personal support workers and social care uh, workers, um, they would be considered to be as key, important individuals. Would you say so, um, Jean? Um, well, I think through, first of all, through the, the system, um, you know, considers personal support worker and social care as important. I think, well, it is underrated, I mm -hmm. think. Um, you know, they have only a lot of PSW care for the task focus and productivity of dressing, toileting, feeding within the long-term care homes. Um, within this type of model, the social and emotional are not considered important and little or no allocation is provided for this type of need in this model. Uh, again, it depends on the long-term care homes. Some of them have moved over to relational or person-centered care approach. Um, but really, the, the funding models that are put in place don't really allow for it. You know, it's, it's the caregivers yeah. going from, you know, room to room, getting all their tasks done yeah. very quickly. So they just don't have time for that. Um, uh, the way the system is organized means that it is impossible to provide a holistic needs. Um, basically, the system is undervaluing and misunderstanding care. They think that... Uh, PSWs, again, as, as Andrew had mentioned, is, is like a factory of doing things uh, very quickly. Um, uh, they think that, I, th I think the system thinks that at the moment, um, home care is just about intermediation uh, in just sending a caregiver to one place to the next to bathe, to wash, feed, and, and provide medication. Um, the assumption is that these are basic tasks that don't require high level of expertise or oversight. We see nursing staff under-resourced for this reason, reason, along with rehabilitation that may be under-resourced. PSW work is undervalued through the system, and the person is undervalued. We have to value care and the person. Absolutely. In yeah. order for anything to change and to, to be better at uh, providing that care. And and I think when you, that level. Yeah, when you make an important point um, that the person includes the caregivers, it includes the, family. yeah. the families. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that um, Mosaic has um, experienced, because they're looking at the wider picture, they're looking at the social emotional needs and the importance of community and the assets that lie in the community. And, and, the interaction with caregivers and family is that we're really dealing with a complicated model that care is complex it's a social thing and that is complex we, we question really seriously question whether for-profit maximizing models are really appropriate to, to, to deliver care in, yeah. in, in these situations and we, we've looked at a number of of simple things like on the boards and uh, the executive responsibilities. There's no human rights function there, no human rights position, and we think they should be there. So we, we believe that um, care is more of a, a social enterprise. Not necessarily the private company shouldn't be involved, but that you have to bring in social communities yes. and, and person-centered objectives, which will take out, uh, you know, some of 
a large portion of your, your, your return, so it's a much more complicated model. It is. Yeah, so it's definitely multidimensional. Yes. It's not just one approach and yes. that's it. Um, yes. It can't be cookie cutter that's type right. of thing. Yeah. So in your opinion, do you feel that, I guess, with the culture, we'll need to change moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to have parts of the system to be updated? Yes, yes, most definitely. Uh, we need empathic and person-centered culture, most definitely. Uh, we need to make changes. If it's a private company, we need the changes from the board down to operations, administration, and other support services. We need more transparency in the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and their decisions need to be informed. We need to integrate with our community. The system is not open enough. We are all codependent, uh, codependent and dependent on each other, and the system acts that the codependency doesn't exist and that it's not important. Yeah, it's very isolating, I find, in long-term care. It's very closed off from community when it should be incorporated um, definitely into community. I mean, one of um, Mosaic's model of care um, that is features in a, an article in, in an academic paper, acknowledges the wider community aspect and the assets that are held within the community and that it's not really possible for the healthcare system to meet all the social, emotional, creative, physical, mm -hmm. spiritual um, things that a person needs to thrive irrespective of what their capacities and abilities are and that the community and other people and social networks are very much part of that. So it's not really solely healthcare's responsibility or long-term care's responsibility yeah. or corporations running it. We as a society need to change. We need to look, realize that we are human beings and that um, we do interact and that there are areas in our world that we have not fully developed. So yeah. this is a societal change. I definitely agree mm -hmm. with you on that yeah. one, absolutely. So, and then with, uh, so, I guess, would we be able to, in terms of with this particular issue in long-term care, to be able to solve it within the healthcare system, or do we really need to look within the wider community? So, I guess just with our mosaic model, um, is that we understand the complete model of care, which depends <clears throat> on the wider community assets and social networks. This is a bigger model. We are a habitat. Um, we need to look at everybody's needs from the point of care interaction, the social, the emotional, the physical, spiritual, community needs from the care interaction. Um, we need the interaction of the wider social network, the wider community habitat, and the cooperation of other organizations and families working together. Uh, we are part of a bigger picture, so we're really needing community agencies to work together, retirement homes, uh, government agencies, private organizations to implement this. Um, so, you know, prior to, prior to COVID, um, I, I think a lot of organizations were working in silos. I think what COVID has brought um, brought us to is, is, is working together. I see more involvement now within organizations reaching out, um, even in our discussions um, on a weekly basis mm -hmm. with community agencies, that has opened up yeah. things as well. Um, yeah. So okay. do, do you think that we need to, I guess, look um, at the initiatives such as the um, WHO's age-friendly cities and communities and the compassionate communities yes, models? most definitely. Um, we have to build our communities um, asset-based as, as uh, what we've spoken at on the mm -hmm. podcast. Um, the WHO and the Compassionate Community Models is looking at the bigger picture. Um, there are compassionate community movements. Uh, actually, Mosaic is part of that. Um, this was a model, actually, which uh, was brought from the UK and used in Win Windsor, Essex. Um, we need to look at community social programs, inter, uh, integrating people in long-term care homes into the community and intergenerational work. Uh, people living in long-term care homes needs things to look forward to. Absolutely. So, so they feel part of the community and they feel connected uh, to live and to be. So, yeah, I mean, so there's been lots of issues with 
definitely long-term care in the past. I mean, I think this has been going on yeah. 20, 30, uh, 40 years ago. Um, and, and COVID is, you know, in the last three months has really brought that to head. Um, and, you know, how, how can we work with families more when, you know, at this point, you know, they're being left out really. And they're, they're, they're actually, you know, have been providing the care yeah. Uh, prior to COVID. So, you know, it's not, I think, as Dr. Sinha mentioned in one of his conversations uh, on a webinar, you know, or, or through the news, is that, you know, once a week visiting just doesn't cut it. It's, you know, these families, it's not just about the visiting. No. They were actually doing things in the long-term care to help their loved ones. Um so just some of the, you know, definitely some of the other organizations um, and people that have been doing a lot of things. I, uh, the International Federation on a Aging actually had a discussion last Friday with Peggy uh, Edwards that was talking about grandparents uh, and, and, you know, families not able to see their grandparents or grandchildren. Um, the Ontario Caregiver Co uh, Organization Coalition, um, they're doing education and resources, uh, government advocacy, um, and also the Change Foundation as well are doing some work. Um, obviously, Dr. Samir Sinha, who's part of the geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network in Toronto, he's been doing a lot of work and pushing out, you know, the need for change. Um, International Federation on Aging, which I've mentioned, and also Margaret Gillis, who's president at International Longevity Centre, Canada. Uh, older persons and families need to have a choice and need to be heard. Uh, protecting human rights during and after COVID. We have to start yeah. looking at that. Um, and, and, and the challenges, I think, that families face within, within this and the human rights. Um, so those are some other, you know, individuals. I think there are some people from New York yeah, University. I, I, I think um, one of the, I, I've been involved in advocacy on the financial services side for the last 15 years. And if you look at what's happening um, in long-term care, you realize that there have been reports after reports after reports on the issues yep. that are there, and nothing has changed. Yes. Um, and so one of the thing, reasons that I found this podcast important and the message this podcast was trying to pass on was that we need to get the voice of those people that have been impacted, and we need representation of that voice within the decision-making process. So this is not just about saying we're unhappy, we're upset. It's about we want a seat at the table, we want a voice, and we want what we do and the importance of what we do embedded into the process and really taken into consideration. Because the very fact that we're shut out means that we're not considered important. I think the central thing of this crisis was that the people in care were not really treated seriously enough. And if they had been treated seriously enough, there would have been much more planning, yes, there would yes. have been much more resources. And even if they'd failed, at least they'd have failed at a bigger scale. So I yeah. think, you know, we need to get the voice together, we need to organize, we need to get that seat at the table. So uh, very supportive of this initiative. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, because I mean, I think with family members, um, which are considered to be the essential uh, visitors, definitely new, need to be a, a stakeholder. Yes. Not just nice words to say, yes, the circle of care, and yes. they're part of that, but as well to have the um, movement behind that and for them to be able to have that voice to be able to, right. to mm -hmm. talk and to advocate for their loved ones. Yeah. And to work as an integrated yeah. team. So exactly. One of the other things that we see within, you know, on the private uh, on the private side is we need more involvement within the community and with some of the hospitals and long-term care because actually um, home care is providing a lot of care in the community. Yes. So again, there needs to be the person's voice of, of who is needing the care, the family, Yes, a personal support worker or whoever's part of that team to be brought to the table to work so they can figure out a plan for that individual. But the person's voice must need to be heard. 
just two yeah. other uh, two other people that are, are actually doing um, some work um, with regards to long term care homes um, that need to be part of the communities is Pat Armstrong and Tamara Daly are two professors plus other individuals who did research on best practices in long-term care from around the world. Um, you know, so I think we need, we definitely need, need more collaboration to engage socially and emotionally as well. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, oh, it was, Jane and Andrew. It was a pleasure really to, to come and, and, and speak about different things and, and I think to help families and just to bring, I think, issues forward, I think, yeah. for people for people to think about in organizations. And, yes, absolutely. Right, so you're doing amazing work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank to you. Get, <laughs> to get this information out. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So, but yeah, no, I just want to... Um, I guess be able to share that information so people do know and they are aware um, because all of what you said is all of what I've experienced yes. in long-term yeah. care and it was very, very hard um, and challenging because yeah. not a lot of family members will be able to have that. Um, and not that, not, not that they won't have the initiative, it's just the fight in them. Yes, well, that, well, well that's it and that's you know some of the things that we experienced with some of the families. Like they were actually literally crying. Yeah because they just didn't know how to deal with it or the long-term care not phoning them or not explaining things yeah. properly to them. You, you, you make a, a tremendously valid point. Um, you know, by the time a person goes into long-term care, the family's gone through a lot, a, a lot of, yeah. a lot of um, effort. And it, I, I see this in other advocacy areas that by the time the person and the family need the voice, they may not be able to provide it because their energy has been yeah. taken up to that point. And so I think as a system, we have to take responsibility and we have to recognize that. You know, some just another point, some families do hire, I mean, if they don't have the energy, which yeah. they're usually burnt out, is, um, and they're not dealing, you know, the long-term care isn't responsive or just patting mm -hmm. the family on the back and saying, okay, we'll deal with it, is that families are hiring geriatric care managers and social workers on their behalf. On their behalf. And not every, then that then starts creating a, a two-tier balance, right? Yeah. Because not everybody can afford no. that. No, no, And it right. can be extremely financially yeah. devastating for yeah. the ones that are willing to sacrifice to say, I'm going to do it either way. Yeah. Yeah, and right? uh, Jane and I have both been family caregivers. Yes. Every, um, so we yeah. know... Um, the tremendous, uh, not just the physical, but mm -hmm. the emotional. Emotional, yeah. And, and you know, this is, you know, having my dad at home, you know, uh, he was in a hospital, he had cancer, and he went downhill quickly. Well, I think there was about a team of 10 people. I mean, it was, yeah. you know, and, and we had to advocate. Yes, yeah. Because they wanted actually to put my dad of 75 into a long-term care home. And I said, that's not what he no. wants. He wants to be at home. So, But families have to be emotionally strong enough to, yeah. to, to deal with the system, to deal with the hospital, to deal with the long-term care. You have to, I don't know, you almost need a course in, in, yes. in, in doing that. In doing that, because they yeah. think by the time they get to the long-term care, they're like, okay, I, I can rest now, but then they then they realize they soon realize oh no my 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 yes. battle is just beginning yes. right and because it's a it's a fight it's a it's a literal fight so yeah. and it's very hard depending on who is there in management um, to be able to listen yeah. and that's right then the you know really as I think we mentioned this as soon as somebody goes into long term care their rights are taken yeah. away whereas if they're staying in their homes um, they have more rights. rights. But thank you. I really appreciate it. this. was really, really good. So definitely on any other issues, if I can yeah. reach out to you sure. guys to come, sure. that'd be well, great. You, yeah, yeah, we did the research. We tried to yeah. do a lot of uh, prep, definitely. Because yes. there's a lot of issues that yeah. you can just go off on a tent.